some um, some things to do. Some outcomes, some actions we can take. <clears throat> I'm going to start by introducing myself because uh, although I know a couple of you very well, uh, some others I don't know at all, and you may not know me. So my name is Ed Harris. I am a statistician. I uh, am also a regular, regular old researcher and uh, lecturer here at, at Harper. I'm the director of the Agriculture Data Science Research Center. I'm the course leader for our MSc in Data Science. And I do a bit of teaching, and I'll come back around to some of the teaching I do later because um, any of the things that I teach that people want to slot in on using R or Python or anything, you're welcome to come and attend anytime. I'm going to go ahead and um, start with um, with a talk. And as I mentioned, I devised this talk for... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, Ed, can I just interrupt? Certainly. Uh, so um, if we are interested, in it, how do we find out which lectures are being taught on which days? I will um, provide that information for you. I'll show you exactly how you can find that. Thank you. We, um, we have a schedule and uh, there is a link to it on the web and I'll, I will be able to find the link and also just give you the Excel file that says that for the whole academic year. So that's a great question about the teaching. Um, now let me find my teams and share my window. All right, I'm, I'm just going to go through this um, talk and I'm going to go rather quickly. Um, if you if anybody wants to stop and ask a question or make any proclamation or anything, just unmute your mic and yell it out. Very informal. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, what skills do we need when we're learning statistics? This is always a, um, oh, it's a perennial point of contention for um, for building courses and skilling up researchers of, of all academic ages, from bachelor students, masters, PhD, postdocs, and even my own colleagues. And I, I like to say sometimes for our classes that um, I've I've taught R to people for about 20 years now. I've done it all over the world in, in Canada, United States, Kenya, Tanzania. I've done it in uh, Belize uh, and, and lots in the UK and, and the United States too. Um, generally, when we're talking about skills, we, we need a hard skill to attain, which is uh, this first one that I call statistical thinking. This is one that we usually informally build up over time uh, during an academic career. I'm just going to um, turn on my, my laser pointer here. Um, and the thinking part is very hard to teach. This is some training that you get passively as a scientist and everybody sort of progresses in this uh, in their own way. We also though, need to design our own methods for uh, data collection, design our own experiments, and uh, and know how to analyze them. And uh, this is the the part of <clears throat> these two minimum skills that we do have training for. You've all probably had a first stats class. There's at least one person here that I know for a fact teaches first stats class too. But I can tell you for all of you, and from even for me, it is lifetime learning to keep up with new things that are happening. And of these two, which one is more important? I'm just going to go quickly through these and um, so that we have time to discuss at the end. The, um, they're both equally important, but the harder one to get is the statistical thinking part. And it's to get into good habits for applying the technical skills. And the, the technical skills, people tend to um, accrue as and when they need them. <clears throat> so if we be more a little bit more specific, one specific mean, uh, minimum that we need for modern standards is to, uh, to have open data, so to prepare the data we collect as if it will be used in the future by someone we never meet or speak to, but another scientist who can create new information using our data as a baseline. And there are standards for, um, for creating open data and sharing it on as well. And tidy data is a concept that is a, is a method for storing your data for the exact same reason. 
And uh, both of these things comprise what we call reproducible practice. So one minimum is just awareness of these. They're, these are quite simple to do, but we must practice them. Um, part of the traditional specific uh, minimum is traditional statistics, simple linear regression, analysis of variance. Um, a really important one that's often neglected uh, in applied science training is effect size. <clears throat> it's the bigness of uh, any difference that we predict or the bigness of an effect. And it refers both to a heuristic effect, like um, how much does it matter if we alter diet for carbon, carbon emissions in beef cattle? But it, it also refers to a technical thing. Effect size is a technical concept in statistics that has to do with um, sample size when we design an experiment. The bigger the effect size, the bigger the difference, and usually the smaller the variation. Um, and it's also related to statistical power. This is the probability for a given effect size and sample size that you do detect a difference, even if it's real. So understanding this concept and being able to apply it is a minimum. Another minimum for getting specific are linear models. These are, you know, they are referred to often in the literature. I really hate it when they're referred to like this, but they're referred to as the, uh, the modern statistics. Um, linear models are, they include models like simple linear regression and you know one way ANOVA. But um, today we think of the generalized linear model that frees us up from restricting assumptions that the real data almost never adhere to, like, um, like the Gaussian residuals, the normal residuals. Uh, and we can design statistical models that fit all sorts of data, even data that have uh, zeros and ones or data that are count data and have a Poisson distribution. Probably the most important one, which I'll come back to again, is linear mixed effects models. Um, this is a very general version of repeated measures type studies, or some uh, fields call them hierarchical studies or multi-level models. They are all linear mixed effects models. Usually applied scientists in agriculture and ecology call them as such rather than those other jargon terms that I said. Another modern concept we have to be uh, aware of um, either to use it like a tool or to avoid it if it's not appropriate is model selection, where uh, let's say you perform some data collection and you perform uh, the collection of, um, of a bunch of variables you're interested in that are dependent variables that you want to make predictions about or make inferences on, and then a lot of things that explain it, like the treatments in an experiment or the a covariate like body size or um, the the sex of an animal. When, uh, when we perform an analysis in a linear model framework, all of those predictor variables, um, if we have a full model, uh, we may want to ask, actually, what's the best model that's the, also the simplest model to explain my dependent variable. And we use an objective tool these days called model, model selection and an objective criterion called the um, AIC to help us decide. So I, I include this firmly in one of the minimum skills we need to be aware of and be able to practice. And then finally, for a lot of us, especially in agriculture, especially if you have a field component to your work, but uh, there are other contexts where this is important, there's the concept that um, that uh, all things that have a spatial component are related to all other things, but close things are more related than distant things. Okay, this phenomenon is called spatial autocorrelation, and there are in the modern statistics specific tools, technical tools to deal with that. And I include this as one of the bare minima that you have to be able to be aware of and 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 utilize not just to analyze your own data, but you need this set of stuff to uh, read the literature because uh, the modern literature, um, all, almost all of it in the fields that you work in now will incorporate this. And if I am hiring a postdoc, I will ask them about all of these things directly or indirectly and, and probably specify them more generally on a job ad application. Otherwise, 
Um, that doesn't say you can't get a postdoc job without knowing about these things, um, because you definitely are hireable as a postdoc by me and other people, uh, oh, a second postdoc or even a lectureship, uh, if, if you're just willing to continuously learn about this stuff. And I know you guys are here, so you are uh, definitely in one of those categories. Now, tidy data is just the, the practice of um, curating your data in a way that makes it analyzable and transparent to other people. I'm just gonna go through this quickly because I wanna leave time at the end, um, but you can look back at these slides, I'll share them on. It's a way of curating your data so that each row is independent of each other row and uh, you have a data dictionary to explain that. And if you're using Excel, that you have a ultimate version of your data set with no embedded stuff, no, no tabs with loads of Excel graphs and stuff like that. It's in an analyzable form as you store it. Um, and that basically goes through this. We use different software for that. Um, you can use spreadsheet file formats. That's just fine these days. We could use a text format like comma and tab delimited. Um, text files are nice because they can be read without any proprietary software. Um, we need a way to store this. You, you, these days, it's much easier than it was just five or even um, 10 or years ago or so, where um, now every, everything is storable and backupable on the cloud. But here's an example of a real data set somebody brought me. It's, it's very organized, but it's not in the tidy format. It's got um, some weird stuff going on with the data. Over here, it's got some invariant values. It's got redundant values for treatments. Um, it's got uh, a, a completely nonsensical col um, column, and it's got embedded stuff so that we would have to do some extraction of this to analyze it in any program. Here's a version of that same exact data in tidy format. Every um, row is independent of every other row. Um, all the names are um, they don't have any weird characters or spaces. They're ready to go for any software. And notice down here, there's a data dictionary tab that explains every single variable, what um, units they're collected in. This is some of the basic practice. <clears throat> Another thing about data is we want to leave our data file raw. I, I see so many times people will have, um, you know, version 18 of their their data and they might do a log transformation and that'll be a new version they might remove some missing um, data rows and that'll be a, a new version but actually you want to curate your data in uh, its raw uncorrected form and uh, remove all the imperfections and do um, calculations that are derivative of your raw data uh, programmatically so that what you have done and anything subjective is documented and transparent. Um, that's a sim essentially what all of this says. I don't know if anybody recognizes the gentleman in the picture, but it's um, it's Ronald Island Fisher, R.A. Fisher, the father of modern statistics. Uh, hard at work, he's probably sitting in his historical office at Rothamsted Station, and he's probably, if I recognize this picture, it is my picture on my slide, but he's probably sitting at a special calculator that he invented called a millionaire machine. And it was just a, a fancy mechanical calculator. Now, um, when, when I have this quote from Fisher, I use this picture and this quote as a metaphor for how I think of my own reproducible practice. So your analysis and your data should be able and accessible to use in the future to exactly reproduce your results. Someone said at the start of this, Anthony, he said you were doing um, um, review kind of work, harvesting summary statistics uh, that might be in published papers and then maybe performing a meta-analysis or something else with it as part of your work. Well, it's much easier if somebody is, has um, performed uh, reproducible practice and published as such. Now, it's gotta be useful by your future self it's got to be useful for a colleague. It's got to be useful for posterity, for meta-analysis. But the metaphor that I use with R.A. Fisher is that, you you know, I aim for every analysis that I do, every data set that I curate to be useful to someone I've never spoken to, someone I greatly respect and perhaps slightly fear. So we're trying to do a good job here. It'll also be useful to your own future self, yourself in the future, because you will forget 
when you accrue more data sets. So what does it look like? Uh, this best practice, it, it entails using open source software, scripting software where you specify your analysis and code and storing your data in an open format. And th this fosters these this gold triumvirate of, uh, of uh, best practice, reproducibility, collaboration potential, and uh, your data being tidy. Now, um, we do have a lot of choices with this for a script-based analysis. Uh, your choices are R, Python, and th there's a really good one called SAS. Now, SAS used to be the only easy game in town. When I was studying statistics in my PhD, um, a lot of the real heavy-hitting people working around me were using SAS. SAS was hugely expensive, but it, it was, you know, the first language that created this best practice environment to do statistics in and, and was bang up to date with modern statistical practices. These days, better choice than SAS is still around. You still can use it. And actually as a student uh, or as a um, researcher at a university, you can actually use it for free these days. But almost nobody does. Almost everybody who does any statistics uses R. Why do they use R? Well, they use R because it's got a gigantic um, community and the community is very friendly in sharing practice. Python is an interesting choice. Awareness of Python is good. It's not as good as R at statistics, but it is much more utilitarian at doing everything but statistics than R. And it, it is um, on its way to be the most popular program in the world by everybody, not just scientists, but amongst scientists specifically, it's really rising in popularity. It's nowhere near as good as R uh, for statistics, though, it's much harder to do the same thing in Python, a lot more code. It's even harder for me to do um, the same thing I can do in R um, for data analysis. Now, menu-based programs like GenStat, like SPSS, they have uh, no, no record of the analysis you carry out. And actually, um, they change over time when they're updated. So we don't, for as far as reproducible practice goes, we don't really know what they're doing. So script files actually become the um, the the method to record your analysis. Um, and I'll give you a little diagram of a workflow in a second. Uh, we use detailed comments in our scripts. We can even use R Markdown to make uh, whole manuscripts or just reports. I do this all the time, and I think my use of R Markdown to automate report making has increased in my own career. Uh, and I, some students really love this, and they take to it right away. Um, and version control is another thing. GitHub um, is a tool that we use for version control to just keep records of a developing project over time. If you've never heard of this or you haven't used it, you know, you can read about some of these aspects of data management in this paper. It's getting a little old now, but still very relevant. Now, what we're here for is talking about R. Um, it, um, oh goodness, what have I done? Never done that before. Let's see here, where am I at? I'm right here, there we go. Um, R is, a, if you've ever heard of the GNU, um, it's a, a software philosophy that is um, open source and free. And it's free in the senses that uh, it costs no money, like free beer. Free beer is, is always nice, but it's also free in the sense of freedom. You have liberty under the terms, terms of the general public license, the GNU um, software license to change the software and the source code is open. Um, R was inspired by other scientists uh, <clears throat> in the spirit of, we've created some good tools and we wanna share it with our colleagues. It was created by, um, by uh, John Chambers and some other people at, at the famous Bell Laboratories in engineering an applied uh, science uh, institution a long time ago. And um, it was actually um, sold. It was so good that Bell Labs sold the intellectual property to create S, which became S plus, uh, which is, I think, probably still a commercial product, but it, R is very much more popular and it's just better than S plus ever was. I used S plus as well early on. So, um, Sometimes refer to R when we're learning it 
as the uh, stages of stats learning. It's a little bit like the stages of uh, mourning when you lose a loved one. You know, we might, if you have to learn R, you might start by being in denial about it. I'm, and then you might become angry. I don't, why am I learning this stuff? Uh, you might uh, bargain, you know, I'm so good at using GenStat. Why would I do this? And then, you know, you may accept it, but you're not happy about it and be a little depressed. And then finally, you accept it. Many people who use R, people who elect to start using it, love it in a short period of time. But the learning curve is very steep, uh, especially right at the beginning. Um, one of the reasons it's steep is we, in a traditional stats program or in Excel, we physically see the data that we're working with and we copy and paste columns and we make a new column for a log transformation. But in a, in a programming environment, um, we use data abstraction. We don't necessarily see a digital representation of a physical ledger all the time. And programmatic thinking requires that level of abstraction, which is a trained skill. This isn't something um, you know, nobody is a data abstraction person innately. You have to practice it. Also, it, it's very helpful if you know or are open to learning some basic programming concepts um, like uh, for loops, if you've ever heard of them. Uh, and if you haven't, it's just a basic programming concept that we use a lot. What I'm surprised is that sometimes, um, even though we all use computers every day, that the how to use computers as a tool, taking responsibility for file management and creating file structures on your computer um, is a skill that not everybody has. And we don't need to these days. We use the web and we use computers as appliances like our phone all the time. But it really helps if you already have basic computing skills or are willing to learn them. And then finally, uh, a big challenge, I have viewed this as an increasing challenge. It's, an, it's a challenge to you when you're learning, is the, um, the syntax style for, um, for R exists in two forms. There's a base R, which is the, um, the type that I think is easier to start with, but there's also the tidyverse, which is very popular. So if you Google for solutions online, the style and the syntax for these two versions of R, you download the same software, you use the same software to do both of them. The, the hard part is, is that syntactically to do the same thing, the thing you would type is totally different between these two systems. Some people prefer tidyverse. It's more programming oriented people tend to prefer tidyverse. And as there is good consistency in the tidyverse for uh, algorithmic thinkers, BaseR was actually created exactly for people who are not programmers. And I find that it's easier to teach with, and it's easier as the starting point to learn R. So uh, I view the existence of both communities online if you just randomly Google, and maybe you're not even aware that these variants exist as, a, as an extra barrier to learning it. There are some advantages. It um, it fits best practice per perfectly. It's uh, it's free and it's open and it's in wide use. It's the most up to date stat software and has been for a long time. And there's no change to that coming. I sometimes see online or on Twitter people saying that oh you know Python's going to do it and take over, but the only people that would say that are people that don't really use statistics very much. Um, from my perspective, uh, even though I love Python and I use it almost every day for computer vision and and, and artificial intelligence research, um, to do basic statistics, you'd be crazy to use Python. On, only if you don't already use statistics would you say something like that. There's a huge community focus just on stats and, and other fun stuff you can do with R. Uh, and it's a very friendly community. Um, it's very prevalent. Someone mentioned that you see it in job ads. That's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, I, R is a little bit like using Office software was 25 years ago. You know, maybe some people had used computers and could use word processing software, and that was something you put on your CV. You know, you I, I couldn't imagine 
putting that on my CV these days. You're just expected to do it. And for, for scientists and academic careers, R is a bit, it's becoming a bit like that. Maybe not in every field, not in agriculture and applied ecology, but uh, it, it seems close. Big employability advantage, and you get transferable skills from this. So if you're going to be hired to do something, it's something you don't have to be trained for if you already are doing it. And I'd advise all of you, if you're interested in learning R, to have that on your CV. I'm, I'm interested. I'm aware that R is important. I'm aware that statistics and I'm, I'm learning. You know, I'm aware of it and I'm building my skills. That will be a much bigger advantage than you say, yeah, I can't do that R thing. I'm only on GenStat. We need to have this for professional development for staff. That's why you are here. Um, we also need it for supervisors. Uh, there is a, a need for that big time here at Harper. It's much easier to supervise students if any of you do that kind of um, work as part of your, your research. Um, even if the supervisor does not use R, I argue it's easier for the supervisor to supervise a student or postdoc who does use R. And the reasons are because of documenting that workflow. And anyone, even if you don't use R, you can run a script without having to write it yourself due to the reproducible nature of it. So this is an example of an old fashioned, non-reproducible workflow where we got the color codes of, uh, th these are data aspects where we you know, have an Excel spreadsheet, maybe we move it to another you know, fixed version of our data. And then we read that into um, you know, some kind of software that's a non-programming one like GenStat or SPSS or you know, insert any other software in there. From that software, we create outputs, <laughs> which tend to be um, copied and pasted into the Word document. And if we have to make additions or um, corrections to the outputs, we, um, we have to go through the cycle of taking it back to the software and uh, going through these intermediate stages again and again. And if someone mentioned right at the beginning of this talk call there, they're um, editing a manuscript. You know, I, I'm, I'm editing a manuscript myself right now. And uh, I cannot imagine doing it the old way of uh, copying and pasting stuff and then having to go back and reproduce all of those steps again. Uh, and when in R, we can just change a few lines of code and click the button and all of our um, outputs are reproducible every time. And they're reproducible by your colleagues, your collaborators, your supervisor as well. Reproducible workflow goes like that. We start with our, our tidy data. Um, we read it straight into R and this represents a, uh, an R script. And notice the colors, the data analysis and report are all represented right in the R script because we can use Markdown to generate a Word doc. Usually what I don't make a manuscript in R, but what my work, usual workflow is, is to generate a, a summary report of figures and uh, statistical outputs that I that I use um, directly um, in a in a manuscript. So it's an exact record of your analysis. This is a game changer and it it um, compensates, it overcompensates for the learning curve of R. Um, now there's this there's just this constant um, argument. I mean I'm I'm where I come from you'd say I'm preaching to the choir here with this because you guys have elected to come here and I know you all want to use R, but uh, I do still encounter this. Um, you know, that's the kind of attitude, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, I've used GenStat for all this time and, you know, it does everything I want. And uh, sometimes I've heard some um, <clears throat> lectures say stuff like, um, well, we, we teach with SPSS and we expect our PhD students and um, our postdocs should use it because they're going to be supervising the undergrad projects as well. And I've, I've also had a surprising one that uh, well the you know the students that I work with they're they're so they're so dull they can't even learn new tricks uh, you know they can't even spell R uh, is my my uh, my joke about it. But um, none of these things are true, and what they don't consider is that uh, 
we have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to yourself to increase your employability. Again, I'm me preaching to the choir. To get a job outside of academia, there is a there's been massive um, research in all developed and developing economies in the world that the need for digital skills um, has outstripped the uh, the su the supply uh, in training. And to meet this digital skills gap, this is this is just one of uh, of many important tools that you must educate yourself on at any stage of your career. Um, thing here at Harper is that um, I, I've heard a few times the attitude that uh, well, you know, we're 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 in agriculture. You know, we do things the old ways um, are, are how we work. But actually, we're positioned to lead the way. Uh, we have a lot of respect and a lot going for us. And I think it's our responsibility to adopt tools that are mainstream and other fields that um, that uh, have higher, frankly, statistical and quantitative standards than uh, than has been traditional in agriculture science. OK, so uh, what skills do we need? Um, this is a review paper. It's quite old, but I, I haven't found a better paper to uh, do this. So keep in mind that the uh, these tools that I just told you about that are mainstream and on my checklist of the important skills that you have to have just to be able to read papers these days, much less make great papers um, yourself that will satisfy picky reviewers, is, uh, is this stuff that I'm telling you about is very old. <laughs> it's just a 30 year old paper. So we've known about this stuff for decades. Um, so this table shows a few things. It, it lists the total articles as of 1990 that uh, were using these traditional simple techniques. And these are still important. There's nothing wrong with any of these. Um, this is, you know, analysis of variance, a t-test to compare two means, the Mann-Whitney u-test. It's a non-parametric version of the t-test and linear regression. Some good old linear regression. Oh, linear regression is one of the most popular um, um, statistical tools and most useful statistical tools still in wide use today. But look at these other guys. The concept of maximum likelihood, mixed effects or random effects. That's those mis mixed effect models for non-independent data that I told you about. The generalized linear model for non-normal uh, distribution data. The AIC used in model selection. Bayesian statistics. Um, this is something that strikes the fear in the mightiest professor in my experience. Uh, Bayesian, I think I heard about that and I don't like the sound of it one little bit. Um, the nice thing about Bayesian, I'll just say it in passing, is that it has none of the um, assumptions that we have to make for, for traditional statistics. But I don't want to digress. Proc mixed is a method um, to implement mixed effects models in that programming software SAS. So um, it, this is specific to SAS, but it, it represents how popular proc mix, uh, mixed effects models had become back then. So uh, these were all in this paper referred to as contemporary statistics. They're, they are referred to as the modern statistics. It's a generalization of um, these traditional models. Um, and they're, they're a little more complex mathematically, but with computers that do all the calculations it's the conceptual part that is important. Mixed effects. Um, I, I mentioned these specifically. These are important in uh, experiments like in field trials where you have blocks. Why do we have blocks? We have blocks because spatially. Um, yep, I'll see you, Anthony. The recording will be here if you want to watch. If you have um, these blocks, you. Um, <clears throat> You, uh, they're non-independent spatially, spatially. So we might block it off and apply our treatment within the blocks to count for that. Or if we do repeated measures on individual animals, like here's Bess who moves through treatment one into treatment two, or maybe at two time periods, or if we have uh, groups in the greenhouse, or if we have plain old spatial data in space, we use mixed effects to account for those. It's one of the important ones. 
I'm going to go past this slide and I'm, I'm basically going to say here that um, down here on the X axis is that for all of these. These um, panels, if we just look at um, this top one here, this is the generalized linear model. This is um, the proportion of papers citing the generalized linear model up to about 1990. And it was increasing then, and this this has just increased. Look at how the use of AIC increased for for model building and comparing models. Look at how the increase of Bayesian has done, and look at the increase of maximum likelihood. This has just continued to the present day. And mixed effects is one of the most extreme ones. Now, um, this is from let me see. This is from a 2016 paper that went from 1990 up to 2016. So look at the trajectory. This is just a peek at uh, statistics courses in different curricula beyond linear models and up to linear models. So uh, a lot of training. Well, you know, let's say that this could be a, applicable to a postdoctoral research group uh, universities as well. So maybe there are none no training listed, but more and more what we see is we have either required or optional training. Now this is for, for PhD students or masters of research. So you can imagine what it's like uh, for postdocs um, is um, we expect there to have been some available training either required or optional for beyond linear models. So that modern statistics I'm talking about I think I want to just go past this because I'm just aware of the time. This is looking at the popularity of software up to 2016, and it, it just charts the rise of R for, for statistics. Now, Python in general is very popular, much more popular than R. But for statistics, R has no comparison. It's by far the most popular, especially in universities, but even in industry. This is just a, um, this is my own data that I harvested a year or two ago from Amazon using the um, popularity of the top ranked books for R or SPSS and for GenStat. And what you'll see is by far the popular books are uh, for stats books are in the language R. So I teach with this one, it's advanced statistics. I teach it on the data science masters. You could attend that class. I'll show you where the, um, material is. I used to teach this book for the master's course in uh, introductory statistics. I, I use a different book now, but it's still an excellent book and it's a bestseller. Uh, Andy Field is a statistician here in the UK, but there are others. You can just see the magnitude of popularity compared to SPSS. Andy Field, that same author who wrote this best-selling R book, this is his best-selling SPSS book, the most popular book on Amazon. Um, in the UK for SPSS, and there are others, still a popular package, though not as popular as R. And uh, just for comparison, GenStat, there was only one book on there. And, you know, it's old, hasn't been updated, just like the software. Not very popular either. These are advertisements for jobs. I'm not going to spend time on this. Um, there are increasing application uh, job uh, advertisements wanting R and quantitative skills. Now I make this, this is the last slide that I'm gonna go over with you before I break and I'll show you some other resources and maybe take some ideas from you guys about um, how to make some of the resources easier for you to consume. But uh, this is a scale. It goes from um, hard to learn up to, uh, let me see. It goes from, I wanna, I wanna erase that. It doesn't go from hard to learn. It goes from uh, effective to learn. And this is less effective. <laughs> and uh, so let me, so that really should say effective. And uh, <clears throat> on this end, it's uh, easy to access. and uh, harder to access. Uh, 
And um, what is easy to access is to take a class or a short course or buy a book or YouTube or a blog or, you know, tutorials online. It's very easy to access this kind of stuff these days for free. And there are good ones you can buy. But I, I view this as on the low effectiveness side of things. Uh, most people learn on the go when you have your own data. A, a lot of people come, some of you I've already had meetings with over the, the months and years. Maybe there are some of you I will see in the future. You can bring your data and we can discuss it and um, mess around with it in R. Um, this is very easy to do. In fact, you have to do it at your job, but it is not very effective. It's not very efficient to learn R and stat stat statistics. Um, if there's a thing you can come and engage with a community and see the practice of others and eventually participate with your own data, this it takes a little effort. So it's it's you know, on the easy to access scale, you have to do a little effort to do this, but um, it it starts to becoming effective when you see others engaging in practice, what they do, you see the standard that's expected or possible in a short period of time, it's very effective. This group is uh, one such community, probably the easiest one for you to access. If you really wanted to, you could in, engage with the, um, the ES data group, we have regular meetings uh, as well. You could come to that, but it's more formal than than this meeting. And we do training in this meeting, unlike the um, the data group. Um, and then finally, you might be surprised at this one. The most effective way for an academic um, is even if your job is primarily not um, teaching, even if you have no role in teaching, there are opportunities to teach statistics here. And you might say, hey, wait a second, how could I teach? I'm trying to learn myself. Um, to teach taught students, all of you are, are cutting edge experts compared to any of them. You've already demonstrated that by the accomplishments you made to uh, work as a postdoctoral researcher. And any of you easily, in fact, I think some of you do teach and have taught with me, um, you could teach R, and uh, this is a very effective way for you to rapidly skill up and engage with a with the class materials that someone else has created. So as a teaching assistant, so uh, these are these are kinds of ways we can do it. I want to show you on um, these pages, and I'll share these slides after some of the resources we have. The uh, Herig website. <clears throat> is uh, here at this URL. And if you clicked on that schedule, you would see an account with tutorials of every meeting that we have. And most of them have YouTube videos associated with them. I created this R Stats Bootcamp. I'll show it to you in a second on, online. It's a full course. Uh, I designed this for students that uh, were coming into the data science masters. This master's in data science is not for computer scientists, it's for people with an agriculture background who want to rapidly skill up uh, in, in data science techniques and computer programming. So I created this boot camp to refresh them on the basics of R and simple statistics, the old traditional statistics. It's a self-guided resource. It's free, it's open, you don't have to log in. You could start tonight, right after this, but I it would be better if you did it a little bit each week, it's divided into 12, um, 12 modules. I'll show that to you in a second. This class is a full first statistics class that uh, I, up until this year, I taught this to the master's students. I have very frequently had postdocs and PhD students attending it, just sitting in informally. It's got the advantage uh, that it's free for you to access, it's easy, it's open, you can guide it on your own. But remember, in my experience, this is one of the least effective ways. Uh, one of the reasons for that, that's probably an attractive reason to most people, is that you're not assessed. But if you're not assessed, there's no incentive to do all of the exercises to completion, and you'll get more out of it if you do do them to completion. And yet, it might be a very good resource to you. There are 
coding templates on here for doing mixed effects analysis, doing model selection, all of that fancy stuff that I said, it's all in this course. They have uh, reduced the breadth of the material they cover, the guys who are teaching it this year. It just ran a couple of weeks ago, um, but it runs once every year and you could attend it uh, in the future. This is another one of my modules. It's again, free and open. Uh, it's not made, this is not really designed to work on, on your own. I do it live with students, um, but it's based on that popular statistical learning textbook. And it's kind of an advanced multivariate stats course. So you will want to have definitely at least be able to uh, engage with the bootcamp material before you attempt this. But it, I cover stuff in here like uh, principal component analysis, um, clustering methods, random forests, um, spatial clustering for spatial data, um, stuff like that. We have a, a this is, is kind of died over the years. It was very popular when I first started and I use it to teach with. It's a chat program called Slack. But since COVID, since we all use Teams, um, it, it's sort of like one extra channel to work in. A nice thing I like about Slack, I still do have this open and you're welcome to join um, and say hi in there and people will say hi back to you, is if you have a coding problem, um, you can format your code in Slack and people in the community and often me myself will quickly answer you back with a with an answer. If, if not within a few minutes or hours, um, certainly within a day or two. It's a little bit like uh, email that's passive and not so intrusive, but it's made for sharing code. And um, so I, I do use this in my own teaching, but we have used it in Herrig, but it's not very active anymore since the days of Teams. So um, I have these recommendations, but I've already said the recommendations and I think I'm going to discard my things and I'll um, unshare my screen and uh, ask you guys what, you would like to help you learn R. You, pr you probably want some kind of formal training. Uh, do any of you use R currently? <clears throat> uh, yes. I know you do, Anna. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are a few of you who do that I can see. Katia as well, Sarah as well. Hi Ed, um, I have not started using it. I tried a few times and then would just get stuck and just really, really struggled with that like initial first step and panic around a whole different language. And I think that's where, yeah, it's like getting over 